magician of her rapt felicities, blithe, sensuous hearted, careless and divine, life ran or hid in her delightful rooms. Behind all brooded nature's grandiose calm, primeval peace was there, and in its bosom held undisturbed the strife of bird and beast. Man the deep-browed artificer had not come to lay his hand on happy, inconscient things. Thought was not there, nor the measurer, strong-eyed toil. Life had not learned its discord with its aim. The mighty mother lay outstretched at ease. All was in line with her first satisfied plan. Moved by a universal will of joy, the trees bloomed in their green felicity, and the wild children brooded not on pain. At the end reclined a stern and giant tract of tangled depths and solemn questioning hills, peaks like a bare austerity of the soul armored, remote, and desolately grand, like the thought-screened infinities that lie behind the rapt smile of the Almighty's dance. A matted forest head invaded heaven, as if a blue-throated ascetic peered from the stone fastness of his mountain cell, regarding the brief gladness of the days, his vast extended spirit couched behind. A mighty murmur of immense retreat besieged the ear. A sad and limitless call as of a soul retiring from the world. This was the scene which the ambiguous mother had chosen for her brief, felicitous hour. Here, in this solitude, far from the world, her part she began in the world's joy and strife. Here were disclosed to her the mystic court the lurking doors of beauty and surprise, the wings that murmur in the golden house, the temple of sweetness and the fiery isle. A stranger on the sorrowful roads of time, immortal under the yoke of death and fate, a sacrificant of the bliss and pain of the spheres, 
love in the wilderness met Savitri. You want to start, Suresh, you'll begin, yeah? Blythe, So this magician, this person who can do magic, this is life. And life here is able to perform this magic of happiness. Felicity is happiness. And there in that place she's creating many different kinds of happinesses. And they are <coughs> wrapped, uh, wrapped means being in a state of intense delight. So, life is blithe. It's a very nice word, not used very, very often. It, it means carefree, being happy in the way of being free of all care and anxiety. Hmm? Sensuous hearted. She's enjoying all the sense experiences, free of care and divine. Life there in all her different forms is running or hiding in those delightful rooms uh, that nature has created for her. And behind all that um, that beauty of nature, behind all that is a grandiose calm, something that's grandiose on a vast scale. <clears throat> behind <clears throat> the foreground with all the birds and the little animals and the flowers and the trees, there are the mountains, silent, calm, unmoving. <clears throat> hmm. Primeval, it's the original peace. Uh, the, that peace that's there in nature. It's holding it is not disturbed despite the little strife that's going on. The birds may quarrel and the beast may kill their prey, but still that peace contains everything. It's not disturbed by those little strifes. <clears throat> Patricia? Man, the deep So this is a place that is still held by nature. Human beings haven't come there to dominate that area. So Sri Aurobindo describes the race of man as the deep-browed artificer. We talk about somebody having a high brow, somebody who thinks a lot. You know? uh, here he says deep-browed, as if concentrating an artificer, a person who makes things. And of course, we have this feeling 
that what we do is artificial. You know, what we do is artifice. Uh, sometimes, of course, it may be art, but what nature does is natural. But what we do is artificial. We have that kind of feeling, you know. We are because we are artificers. We make things that nature has not made by herself. Life had not learned its discord with its aim. The life that we know is full of discords and clashes, no? but that's a characteristic perhaps more of human life. There in the world of nature, um, there is still a natural harmony. Say again. Oh, the mighty mother, the creative force, no? There she's lying at ease, enjoying. Everything is in line with her first satisfied plan. This plan of earth, uh, full of life, in harmony. That first plan has been satisfied before the coming of man. So there the trees are expressing, putting out their flowers and their leaves, moved by a universal will of joy. Behind everything there is that will of delight and it gets expressed so beautifully in the plants. And there are the wild children and all the birds and animals, but Sri Aurobindo says they have pain-forgetting minds. It's not that they never experience pain, but the pain passes and they forget it. They don't brood on it the way that we t human beings tend to brood on our sufferings. Yeah. Emily, can you read? At the end we climb a stern and giant tract of tangled depths and solemn questioning hills peaks like a bare austerity of the soul, armoured, remote, and desolately grand, like the thought-screened infinities that lie behind the rapt smile of the Almighty's dance. Mm. So at the end, she must be at the entrance to a valley, no? and at the end of that valley, there's lying this stern and giant tract that's not full of blossoming trees and flowers. It's a, a rocky wall there. And there, there are tangled depths, bushes, solemn questioning hills, and tall peaks that are like um, souls aspiring for the heights, leaving behind the, the world a bare austerity. Austerity, it's when you strip yourself of everything to make yourself pure. And because these are hills, this is the Himalayas, no? they are armored, they are so strong, and they are remote, and they are far away, and they are grand. They are on a grand scale, but desolately grand. The higher levels, there's nothing growing, no? So he says those, uh, those hills there, they, uh, he compares them with thought-screened infinities that lie behind the rapt smile of the Almighty's <coughs> dance. Here in South India, we are familiar with these beautiful images of uh, Lord Shiva as the creator and the destroyer of the world, dancing in a ring of fire, no? Nataraja. And uh, he has that 
rapt smile on his face. But behind that image, Sri Aurobindo says, there are infinities, the, the infinities of the divine consciousness that are screened from us by thought. Hmm? So those hills are something like that. They rep here in the front is the smile, the smile of nature, and behind are those bare infinities, austere and grand. Mahalinga. In the stone fastness of the mountains, regarding the brief gladness of the days, his vast extended sleep holds behind. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful image. It also recalls Shiva, no? Yes. Yes, so mm -hmm. he's comparing this landscape with the forest and the mountain. It's like Shiva with his hair, his matted hair. Um, catching the downpouring of the river Ganga descending from heaven. No? Sh Shiva, we know it's Shiva because the, the blue throat, that is the characteristic of Shiva, who has swallowed all the poison of the world and held it to save, to save us. Nilkant is his name, yes. <coughs> so it's as if Shiva himself is there, no? looking out from this mountain cave. A fastness is a safe place, a place where nobody can uh, reach him. Hmm? And he's looking out <coughs> on the brief gladness, the, the passing happiness of the days. And his vast extended spirit is stretched behind in the form of the great mountain range of the Himalayas. Hmm? This fastness means the force also. Yes, a fastness. It's a strong, uh, protected place, can't be reached easily. Hmm? Uh, Joel? The mighty murmur of immense retreat, besiege the ear, sad and limitless call, as of a soul retiring from the world. Mm. So there's that sound, the sound of the forest, a mighty murmur fading away in the distance, of immense retreat. Sri Aurobindo says it's, it's like that uh, sad and limitless call. It's like a soul leaving the world, go, going away from it. Mm. That, that murmur, it besieged the ear. It is uh, constantly pressing on the ear. We hear that sound of the forest. Mm. Gumson? This was the scene in which the ambiguous mother had chosen for her free to facilitate our work. Here in this solitude far from the world, of part she began in the world of joy and strife. So this is the destined meeting place. This was the scene which the ambiguous mother, Mother Nature, with we never know what she intends, no? Has chosen this scene for her brief felicitous hour. I think here this her refers to Savitri. Hmm? And also the, in the line, the last line of the sentence. So it's here in this solitude, in this lonely place, far from the world. Her part she began, Savitri began her part in the world drama, 
in the, all the conflict and strife and struggle and the joy of the world. Justin. Here where it's closed, the heart and it records the lurking doors of beauty and surprise, the wings that murmur in the golden house, the temple of sweetness and the fairy tale. Mm. So he, here were disclosed to her, something that's closed, it's disclosed, it's made open, we can see it. So she, here she discovers, she, uh, revealed to her, mystic courts, entrance places, no? uh, hidden doors of beauty and surprise wings that murmur that make their sound in the golden house this golden house he says is the temple of sweetness so this is the house of love and it has a fiery aisle the, the aisle is the uh, <coughs> the passage in the center of a church and uh, it's the, the, the aisle where the bride walks down to meet the bridegroom. And when he says fiery, it suggests all the intensity of passion, the passionate delight and passionate suffering that love can bring. Hmm? Ganga Lakshmi. Stranger on the sorrowful roads of time, immortal under the yoke of death and fate, the sacrific sacrificant of the bliss and pain of the spirit, love in the wilderness meet so. mm, Wilderness in this yes. wi wild place, no? A wilderness. Yes. Mm -hmm. So who is this stranger? This is love. Love is a stranger on the sorrowful roads of time. Love is immortal, even here under the yoke of death and fate. <coughs> a sacrificant, a sacrificant, one who makes or offers a sacrifice. So, Sri Aurobindo often hints here and there in the poem that the whole earth nature is offering a sacrifice, a sacrifice of suffering and delight. All this is offered to the higher planes. So love is part of all that. We can also think that these last four lines, they hint a little bit at Satyavan. If we think back to the author's note, that um, Satyavan is the soul you know, in the grip of ignorance and death under the yoke, and Savitri has come to save him. You know? So. Here, this love is immortal like the soul under the yoke of death and fate. And uh, of course, Savit Satyavan will be a stranger to Savitri at first when they meet. So, love in the wilderness meets Savitri in the form of Satyavan. Anybody would like to ask anything about these? <laughs> these? That love, it says love in the wilderness met Savitri, yeah. but uh, love meets her in the form of Satyavan. 
and these other three lines we can say these also we could read them as if they apply to Satyavan the, the soul in the grip of ignorance and fate immortal but in the grip and he will uh, yeah yes Oh, well, now he takes us back to um, Canto 2, or the canto, end of Canto 1 of the whole poem. Um, Savitri wakes up in the morning, mm. and she remembers, at the beginning of Canto 2, we have the description of her remembering everything that has happened uh, leading up to this day of fate when Satyavan must die. So here we get a reference to that. All she remembered on this day of fate. The road that hazarded not the solemn depths, but turned away to flee to human homes. The wilderness with its mighty monotone. The morning like a lustrous seer above. The passion of the summits lost in heaven. The titan murmur of the endless woods. As if a wicked gate to joy were there ringed in with voiceless hint and magic sign upon the margin of an unknown world reclined the curve of a sun-held recess groves with strange flowers like eyes of gazing nymphs peered from their secrecy into open space. Boughs whispering to a constancy of light, sheltered a dim and screened felicity, and slowly a supine, inconstant breeze ran like a fleeting sigh of happiness over slumberous grasses pranked with green and gold. Hidden in the forest's bosom of loneliness, amid the leaves the inmate voices called, sweet like desires enamored and unseen, cry answering to low, insistent cry. Behind slept emerald, dumb remotenesses, haunt of a nature passionate, veiled, denied to all but her own vision lost and wild. Earth in this beautiful refuge, free from cares, murmured to the soul a song of strength and peace. Only one sign was there of a human tread. A single path shot thin and arrow-like into this bosom of vast and secret life pierced its enormous dream of solitude. Here first she met on the uncertain earth the one for whom her heart had come so far. So this is what 
Savitri is remembering a year later on the day that Satyavan must die. She remembers all this. Martin. All she remembered on this day of fate. The road that hesitated not to solemn death, but turned away to flee to human homes. The wilderness is its mighty monotone. The morning, like a lustrous seer above, the passion of the summits lost in heaven, the tidal murmur of the endless wolf. Mm. So the road that she's traveling on doesn't go into that valley. Hmm? It doesn't uh, dare, it doesn't take the risk of going into these solemn depths. It turns away. The road, of course, is going towards human habitations. Hmm? She remembers that it, the road went another way. And this is significant because of course, if she hadn't noticed Satyavan, then she would have missed this moment. He refers to it a little later on. The wilderness, the forest, with its mighty monotone, this vast greenness, and that sound, that murmur, and the morning, like a lustrous seer, a seer of light, the, the sun shining, the blue sky, and the intensity of those summits, the high peaks reaching up into heaven, and that titan murmur of those endless woods, the sound of the, in the leaves. Titan, it means also on a very grand scale, it's a, it's something large and grand. Then Lakshmi. As if a wicked gate to joy, joy were there, ringed in with voiceless heat and magic sign. Upon the margin of an unknown world, reclined the curve of a sun-held recess, Grows with strange flowers, like eyes of gazing nymphs, peered from their secrecy into open space. Bows whispering to a constancy of light, sheltered a dim and screened felicity, and slowly a supine, inconstant breeze ran like a fleeting sigh of happiness over slumbrous grasses. With green and mm. So what a beautiful picture. Hmm? He says, as if a wicked gate to joy were there. A wicked gate is a, is a little gate. A little gate made of uh, um, twigs, branches. Hmm? And uh, I think there's one other place, perhaps, in, in the poem where he mentions this wicked gate. I, I'm not sure, but I think it's an allusion to the book The Pilgrim's Progress, where the pilgrim enters on his quest through a little narrow wicked gate. It's not a grand entrance. It's a small, unobtrusive way that he can enter on the the path to heaven. So in that little gate there, is, uh, it's as if there are hints and signs surrounding it to, to give her the hint, you know, to take notice. It's ringed in with voiceless hint. There are hints, they are not saying anything, but they are there, these magic signs. So that one of those signs is that on the margin, on the edge of that unknown world, there's the curve, a beautiful curve, of a sun-held recess. Something is uh, going away from the road into the wilderness, 
but it's open. The sun is shining on it as if there's a, a spotlight saying, look here. Hmm? And there, there are groves. There are little uh, sheltered spaces with strange flowers, uh, like eyes of gazing nymphs. Nymphs are the, the forest spirits, no? And they are looking out, peering from their secrecy in the forest. They're looking out into that open space. And there are the branches, the boughs of the trees. They are whispering to this area where there's a constancy of light. Under the boughs there will be shade, but the boughs are leaning out into the light. And at the same time, they are sheltering, hiding, a dim and screened felicity. They are hinting that if you enter here, you will find happiness. And there's a little breeze, a slow breeze, inconstant. It's coming and going, and it's supine. It's running along the ground. He says it's running, it's also hinting at happiness. It's like a fleeting sigh of happiness. Yes, yes, that's what it means. It's not high in the air, this breeze. It's near to the ground, supine. Over these grasses, these grasses seem to be sleeping. They're slumbrous and they're, they're very beautiful because they're decorated with the gold of the sun and the, the green, pranked, ornamented with green and gold. So she remembers all that in detail. Rosa, can you read? Can you manage? I will try. Yes. I see very, very bad. <laughs> Hidden in the forest forest bosom of loneliness <laughs> amid the leaves the inmate voices called sweet like desires 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 uh, in a moment and uh, unseen cry, answering to low, insistence cry. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so it's as if the forest has a bosom. No? It's a lonely one, hidden in it, in the forest, amid the leaves. The, the beings who live there, the creatures who live there, an inmate is somebody who lives these are inmates of the forest. We can hear their voices calling, mainly birds probably, their sweet voices. And their voices are expressing love, like desires, enamored. Enamored means in love and unseen. And one cries and another answers, cry answering to low, insistent cry. So the cries are repeated. You know, we hear the doves or those coils. Their cries are also insistent. Hmm? So behind all that, these emerald, dumb remotenesses, the distances, as if they're asleep. And the, those are the haunts, the places where this nature moves, this nature which is passionate, veiled, screened, denied. Nobody can go there and see it except her, herself, her own vision, lost and wild. Nature is at home there. Earth, in this beautiful refuge, it's a it's a place which is a refuge from all the strife of human life. It's free from cares. It's murmuring to the soul, 
a song of strength and peace. And there, there's only one sign of a human tread, a little path. It's going thin path, like an arrow pointing into the forest, into the bosom, into the heart of this vast and secret life, piercing its enormous dream of solitude. So that's a sign of a human presence, this little path. And here, this spot, is where first she met on the uncertain earth the one for whom her heart had come so far. On this uncertain earth, nothing is certain here. This is where she met him for the first time on earth, but later on she feels that she has met him many times before. So shall we read these lines from the beginning? Magician of her rapt felicities, blithe, sensuous-hearted, careless and divine, Life ran or hid in her delightful rooms. Behind all brooded nature's grandiose calm. Primeval peace was there, and in its bosom held undisturbed the strife of bird and beast. Man, the deep-browed artificer, had not come to lay his hand on happy, inconscient things. Thought was not there, nor the measurer, strong-eyed toil. Life had not learned its discord with its aim. The mighty mother lay outstretched at ease. All was in line with her first satisfied plan. Moved by a universal will of joy, the trees bloomed in their green felicity, and the wild children brooded not on pain. At the end reclined a stern and giant tract of tangled depths and solemn questioning hills. Peaks like a bare austerity of the soul, armoured, remote, and desolately grand, like the thought screened infinities that lie behind the rapt smile of the Almighty's dance. A matted forest head invaded heaven, as if a blue-throated ascetic peered from the stone fastness of his mountain cell, regarding the brief gladness of the days. His vast extended spirit Couched behind. A mighty murmur of immense retreat besieged the ear, a sad and limitless call as of a soul retiring from the world. This was the scene 
which the ambiguous mother had chosen for her brief felicitous hour. Here in this solitude, far from the world, her part she began in the world's joy and strife. Here were disclosed to her the mystic courts, the lurking doors of beauty and surprise, the wings that murmur in the golden house, the temple of sweetness and the fiery isle. A stranger on the sorrowful roads of time, Immortal under the yoke of death and fate, A sacrificant of the bliss and pain of the spheres, Love in the wilderness met Savitri. All she remembered on this day of fate. The road that hazarded not the solemn depths, but turned away to flee to human homes. The wilderness with its mighty monotone. The morning like a lustrous seer above, the passion of the summits lost in heaven, the titan murmur of the endless woods. As if a wicked gate to joy were there, ringed in with voiceless hint, and magic sign upon the margin of an unknown world reclined the curve of a sun-held recess. Groves with strange flowers like eyes of gazing nymphs peered from their secrecy into open space. Boughs whispering to a constancy of light Sheltered a dim and screened felicity And slowly a supine inconstant breeze Ran like a fleeting sigh of happiness Over slumbrous grasses Pranked with green and gold. Hidden in the forest's bosom of loneliness, Amid the leaves the inmate voices called, Sweet like desires enamoured and unseen, Cry answering to low insistent, Cry. Behind slept emerald dumb remotenesses, haunt of a nature passionate, veiled, denied to all but her own vision lost and wild. Earth in this beautiful refuge, free from cares, murmured to the soul a song of strength and peace. Only one sign was there of a human tread, a single path shot 
thin and arrow-like into this bosom of vast and secret life, pierced its enormous dream of solitude. Here first she met on the uncertain earth, the one for whom her heart had come so far. <laughs> 